Hello everybody, this is Wrangler back again with another video about the uh, Mega. I hope you're all keeping safe and well. Uh, certainly where I am we're back in lockdown once again and what do you do when you're stuck in lockdown? Well it is fiddle about with Amiga things and I thought I would return to something I looked at briefly in a previous video which is the digital signal processor on the AA3000 Plus motherboard. Uh, my previous video I just showed that just waking up and doing something I thought it's about time we did something a little bit more dramatic with the DSP chip so more of that in a minute. Um, just a reminder if you like the videos that you're watching here don't forget to hit that subscribe button down below and you will get a notification of when my next videos come out. But for now let's talk DSP uh, and uh, a little bit of background on that. So what you're looking at here is my AA3000 Plus replica motherboard and what this is a replica of is a prototype that was beginning to be produced by Commodore just after the A3000 itself had launched. They were wondering where to go next. Um, and, and that involved building in extra features uh, but still fitting the motherboard to the same case as an A3000. Uh, and of course that never actually came to anything um, except the very much cut down A4000 that we all know uh, and love. But uh, what would have happened if the enhanced A3000 as originally envisaged have been produced well we'll never quite know will we but uh, the AA3000 plus is a modern replica intended to show off at least some of the features that had been planned and one of those is the DSP chip digital signal processor so let's just have a quick look at that so let me just move the camera in nice and close and hopefully you'll be able to see that a little bit more clearly so uh, we're now zooming in on the motherboard and what have we got there? I think that's the Gary chip upside down. Uh, we've got the 68030 over there. Uh, but over here with Lucent written on the top of it is the DSP chip, uh, specifically the DSP3210 chip, originally from AT&T who were then bought by Lucent who were bought by you know, a whole long stream of other people. But that is the chip that was particular to these prototype boards. Um, more on that in other videos of exactly the history there, but the digital signal processor chip that never actually ended up in any production Amiga, but is on these replica boards. Why do we care? Well, what was special about DSP chips is their floating point capabilities. So they could do mass very, very quickly uh, and, and process data coming in from the main processor here. Now, of course, since that time, um, processor CPUs have got their own floating point units. Uh, when the O30 was produced, that was a separate chip, which is down here. You can't see it at the moment. Uh, and then eventually those got integrated into the CPU. Uh, so you had a single chip that could do both integer whole number maths and floating point maths with fractions uh, and in fact my accelerator card if I just zoom out a bit here you can see I've switched over to a Cyberstorm Mark II and under this big fan and heatsink here is the 060 chip on that which has a built-in floating point unit so kind of things moved on a bit with CPU design to build in floating point capability but at the time the uh, Amiga prototype was being prepared. The floating point performance uh, of the O30 and its FPU uh, was not great and the DSP provided a way to boost floating point performance. Um, and so that was the reason why it was added into the prototype. Uh, also it's a kind of, it's a processor in its own right so if you are careful about the way you program the thing, it can get on with tasks at the same time that the CPU is doing things, they can process in parallel um, and uh, you know with really careful programming you can have both uh, processors operating on the same task. Not quite at that stage yet but uh, what I want to show you is 
using this DSP properly. Uh, and by properly, I mean a real application that's actually using its capabilities more than just sort of waking it up, which is what was in my previous video. So that's the background. Enough chat. I think it's about time we fired this up and actually showed you what I'm talking about. OK, so here we are in the workbench. Uh, so let us start the program and it's back to one of those favourites from the 1990s, the 2000s, the Mandelbrot set. So here we have the program producing a very familiar image. Uh, and what I did was to take some pre-existing code, so a program called Mandel, written in the 90s by Eric Trollson, and I also borrowed some code from a Mac program called Artabrot by George T. Warner uh, and pulled that together. Um, why Mac code, you might be asking yourself? Well, certain Macs, Mac Quadras, also had exactly the same DSP chip in them. Uh, so a bit of uh, software was written for that, including this program called Artabrot. Uh, so that was ready-made code, uh, which I happily borrowed, put it all together uh, to produce this updated Mandel program, Mandel DSP. So there we go. That is the 060 uh, coming up with the Mandelbrot um, picture. Uh, and top left here you can see that took 35 seconds to do, but if I hit this key on the keyboard then uh, actually we will redraw that, not using the FPU, but using the DSP. So here the 060 is doing all the work to colour the pixels, uh, but the heavy lifting of all the number crunching to work out the colours of each pixel is done by the DSP. It's a sort of double act going on. So all the floating point calculations, because drawing this picture is really floating point calculation intensive, is done by the DSP. Uh, now, what might not be quite so apparent looking at this video, but if you compare carefully, is these dark areas, the black in the centre, is where lots of uh, calculations are going on. Uh, out on the edges, much less calculation. They happen quite quickly. The, in the centre, it needs a lot more effort. Um, actually, the DSP doesn't slow down as much there as the 060 does. Uh, uh, and because uh, there's quite a bit of overhead for the uh, to set up the DSP and then work out sort of pass back the answers to the 060 that takes some extra time for each pixel to do that handoff uh, but the actual raw calculations in this in the middle the DSP is doing pretty quickly so um, overall 63 seconds uh, not as fast as the 060 um, but uh, it's not too bad I mean let's just zoom in a bit on some of the detail bit uh, where it's more labor intensive uh, and we'll just see how we get on there with a bit of the comparison. Um, now you might notice uh, I'm not sure if this is showing up on your feeds or not, but we've got kind of a rogue pixel here, which is clearly the wrong colour, and there's another one up here, which is the wrong colour. Uh, still encountering some difficulties with the DSP chip and certain accelerators. So, as I said before, I'm using a Cyberstorm Mark II, uh, which the DSP mostly seems to work with, but occasionally doesn't. They sort of fall in and out of love, it would seem. Uh, other, another user, Trickster, who's been beta testing this for me, he's got a warp engine in his computer that works beautifully the whole time. So it's not entirely clear why uh, some accelerators work better than others, but it's just one of those things. So, OK, there the DSP took 72 seconds to render that image. Now let's switch back to the 060 uh, and see how long that takes. Um, given this is a bit more labour intensive. 
drawing exactly the same picture um, and uh, we'll see what the performance is. Uh, you might be wondering actually while we're talking about processors uh, why am I not showing you this on the O30 which is what's on the motherboard uh, and there is a simple reason for that which is uh, the O30 processor can calculate the Mandelbrot, it takes a long time, much longer than O60, not surprisingly. Uh, but the fact is that the DSP doesn't play nicely with the O30. Again, why is that? Not sure, we have not got to the bottom of exactly why the DSP seems very, very picky on the CPU it's working with and the specific accelerator it's working with. Um, Perhaps let's just talk quickly about the Mandelbrot, what is actually going on here. So uh, imagine the screen here is like a map. Uh, so each pixel's got some coordinates, if you like, it's latitude and longitude, so east, west, north, south. Uh, so two coordinates. And then what the Mandelbrot program is doing is to take those two coordinates and just multiplying them together and adding on the num numbers they started with and keep doing that. And, you know, if you start with number line 2 and keep multiplying it by itself you get 2, 4, 8, 16, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and goes off to infinity eventually but if you start with a number like a half instead and multiply that by itself you get a half, a quarter, an eighth, a sixteenth it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and all this is doing is counting how long it takes for a given pixel to go off to infinity or not and not is black on this diagram and then the colors are the ones where it does go off to infinity and just how long it took to go that far and obviously it doesn't really go to infinity it puts a cap on that and just says that's good enough how long does it take to get to that cutoff point if you like okay enough of the maths mumbo jumbo how long did that take 79 seconds i think it was 63 wasn't it with the dsp so you can see as we get more detailed on the calculations uh, actually the dsp begins to come into its own because the overhead i was talking about before uh, of passing data back and forth makes less difference when there's more number crunching to do in the middle and you get that the more you zoom in. So I think that's pretty impressive uh, performance from the DSP given that this would have been uh, a prototype that might have come out in the early part of the 1990s maybe mid 1990s would have had some pretty serious performance certainly compared to an O30 with its own FPU chip. It's holding its own here against an O60. Um, also, you know, this is the DSP actually doing something vaguely interesting, vaguely useful, and as far as I know, that's the first time that's been done since the Commodore, in your, done in an Amiga, I should say, since the Commodore engineers were uh, using their prototypes in the 90s. So that makes this sort of interesting from a historical perspective. But, I have a confession to make. I have been sandbagging a little bit on the CPU performance. Uh, so let me just fess up to that. Uh, in showing you what I was working on then, I had turned off the data cache for the CPU. So uh, let me turn that back on again. Um, why did I turn the data cache off? Well, the point is with the DSP, it is operating outside of those data caches so when it updates memory you've got to tell the processor to update the cache because otherwise uh, when it goes to read the answers it just reads those from its cache the old figures if you like it doesn't take into account the new figures which haven't made it into the cache at that point and that process of updating the caches actually is really time consuming so if you're doing that for every pixel it's a real burden on the DSP performance. So I turn them off just to show them to you. Uh, let's turn them back on again uh, and uh, importantly the copy back cache here for the O60 which we'll show you in a minute and let's just show you what O60 full performance is like. Um, yeah quite a bit faster isn't it? 
So that only took 10 seconds to do um, what were we before in the 30s or something. Uh, let's zoom in again, see how we do. So why is it so much faster for the CPU when we turn the data cache back on? Uh, now I'm no expert in this kind of stuff, but I think the reason for that is that it just takes the CPU quite some time to write the answers back out to RAM, in this case chip RAM, uh, to be displayed on the screen like this. Uh, and chip RAM is really slow. So if you're gonna make the processor wait for that to happen, then it just takes a really long time to do. Whereas this, the 060 for certain has this copy back capability, cache capability. So the CPU just writes to the cache and then another part of the chip copies that from the cache to the main RAM while the the uh, CPU is getting on with something else. So, so kind of they divide up the tasks, the single chip divides up the tasks into two and operates on them simultaneously, which as you can see, results in a big speed up. Uh, let's have another zoom in. Really does start making a difference. Now, uh, the uh, DSP can't really take advantage of anything quite similar um, but you know maybe that's just we have to say hats off to the designers of the 060 for uh, implementing that copyback cache feature because it really does make a big difference so there we are a bit of a zoom in 44 seconds. Let's see what the DSP can manage on the same picture. As I say, I think it will get a, 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 an advantage in the raw processing power, but has the disadvantage that it, it can't uh, use caching to speed up the memory transfers. Almost done. It's getting very nostalgic seeing all these Mandelbrot pictures. 63 seconds. Uh, so uh, not quite as fast as the, uh, the 060, but not, you know, getting on for a similar kind of pace. So you can see perhaps if I zoomed in more and more and more, then um, uh, the DSP would start to show its colors. Anyway, I think that demonstrates the point here that uh, you can program up the DSP to do more interesting things. It was quite some effort to do it. Uh, the DSP isn't the easiest chip to program, I've got to say, but it can be done. You can get the DSP to do some interesting things. I'm hoping more skilled programmers than me start getting interested in this uh, and doing more demanding things with the DSP, you know, would be really interesting, wouldn't it? If someone could write a module so that the DSP can decode MP3 files while the process is getting on with something else, uh, so we can listen to all our favorite tracks uh, on the Amiga without tying up the processor. That would be a really cool thing to do. I think that's a little bit beyond my capabilities as a programmer, I've got to admit to that. Uh, but otherwise, this shows you the kind of thing that is possible and would have been possible back in the early 90s if Commodore had ever followed through. I hope you've enjoyed watching. Don't forget to smash that subscribe button if you enjoyed it. Uh, and otherwise, I will see you again next time in the next video. Thanks for watching. Bye.